My name is Beverly. I am Congressman Sean Patrick Maloney's senior legislative assistant. I do obviously LGBTQ issues and our work on the House Equality Caucus, which the Congressman is a co-chair. Uh, we're joined today by some really, really great panelists and advocates who have been in the space for a long time and are incredibly impressive. So I'm excited to hear from them. We have KJ, we have Sam, we have Sharita, and we have Jody. Um, I'll let them introduce themselves and kind of talk about what they're working on and what they're excited about um, this Pride Month as we wrap up June. And then we'll go through a couple questions and just talk about you know, what's happening in the world as far as um, LGBTQ rights, conversion therapy, state laws, representation, um, the Equality Act, so many things to discuss. So Sam, do you wanna kick us off? Sure. Hey, y'all. Uh, my name is Sam Brinton. I use they and them as my pronouns. I have the illustrious honor of serving as the Vice President of Advocacy and Government Affairs at the Trevor Project. If you don't know what the Trevor Project is, we're the nation's largest suicide prevention and crisis intervention program for LGBTQ youth. I'm super excited to be part of this conversation because I think um, that uh, as I like to tell a lot of people, um, Stonewall isn't history. Stonewall is what we're like living right now. We're still facing so many of the same issues. And as a person who works on, you know, a suicide lifeline for LGBTQ youth, I hear those issues each and every day. And I'm really glad that we're going to finally bring some of them, you know, uh, it may be the last month, day of Pride Month, but far, far from the last uh, day that we need to be working on these issues. So really excited. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Sam. Um, I also meant to mention if anyone that is logged on has a question, feel free to throw it in the chat. If we have time at the end, I will maybe go through a few. But next up, Jody, do you want to tell us a bit about the work you do? Sure. And thanks, Beverly. And thanks uh, to Congressman John Patrick Maloney for hosting this Pride Day event. And I'm pleased to be on with KJ with Sharita and Sam. It's a great crew uh, and thanks to everyone for all the good work um, that you do. Uh, my name is Jody Winterhoff. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the Senior Vice President for Policy and Political Affairs at the Human Rights Campaign. Um, we're the largest LGBTQ advocacy and civil rights organization in the country. Uh, and uh, many of our members are in your district, uh, Beverly. And so I'm happy to uh, be sharing this with them today and with others across the country. Um, uh, I'm particularly um, excited um, to be with this group today because I do believe that the discussion around conversion therapy and the um, efforts that have been uh, made in, in supporting our LGBTQ youth from medical professionals, from folks in states that do advocacy for kids, from those of us who do this at the national, state, and local effort like this group on this call, it is a critical issue and it's one in the puzzle of what we need and what we need to do <clears throat> for the LGBTQ community. So I really appreciate that you're shining a really bright light on this today and I look forward um, to this discussion. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jody. Sharita? Hi folks, thanks so much for having me. My name is Sharita Gruberg, she, her pronouns. I have the absolute privilege of being the vice president of the LGBTQ Research and Communications Project at the Center for American Progress. For those not familiar, we are a multi-issue think tank with over 20 policy teams um, that cover just about everything from race equity to women's rights, to economic security, to climate change, to healthcare, to national security. We're the only think tank with a dedicated disability project. Um, and the LGBTQ team really reflects the rest of the organization in covering just about every issue Trump covers through an LGBTQ lens on how it impacts um, our lives and well-being. And I am so thrilled that today we announced our new executive director, Patrick Gaspard. So uh, really, really thrilled for everyone to soon uh, get to know him better at CAP as well. Um, really grateful uh, to the congressman for having this uh, wonderful panel and for giving me the opportunity to join these incredible advocates and experts. Um, these are such critical issues. We work so much on uh, impacts of discrimination and inclusion and well-being and health and uh, conversion therapy is just such an affront to the existence and the ability of our community uh, to thrive. I'm so really grateful for all of the efforts of everybody on this call today. Awesome, thank you, Sharita. And last but not least, KJ. 
Hi everyone, Karen Jones, go by KJ, pronouns they, them. I'm California Legislature's first non-binary legislative director working for assembly member, doc, uh, Dr. Joaquin Arambula, representing Fresno. Um, the assembly member sits as chair of the budget subcommittee on health and human services, which is incredibly important because this year we have had an amazing opportunity to really make sure that we're supporting our most vulnerable and being able to use a budget of opportunity to really invest in health and human services, including that in the LGBTQ community. And being a representative from Fresno, really making sure that we're advocating for pride because not all of California is as progressive as you think, and the fight is needed everywhere. So very happy to be here with this amazing panel to have this conversation. Great, thank you so much. And thank you again, everyone, for joining us. We so appreciate it. And I know the Congressman really appreciates all the work that you guys do. So let's get started with um, conversion therapy, which is an issue really important to the boss. Um, for the first time in history, state legislatures have been considering pro-conversion therapy bills designed to enshrine the practice of conversion therapy in state law. We can see this in Texas, Arizona, North Carolina. How do we combat this effort at the federal level? Um, and what is kind of a number one first step? Jody, if you wanna touch on that, that would be great. Sure, and just to give some context, certainly not for this this panel, but for those in the audience, you know, I, I think it's it's also good to know that you know there are various names that conversion therapy. Sometimes it's known as reparative therapy, and it, it's a range of dangerous and discredited practices that falsely claim that they can change a person's sexual orientation or gender identity or expression. So you know. Mainstream medical uh, associations, providers have just up and down um, uh, the, the list rejected these practices. It's important to know that the basis on which these are done are not based in medical science and are not supported by health providers and associations. So just to kind of set the context a little bit, Beverly, and one of the challenges of, of thinking about what can we do federally you know, I sometimes talk with my hands, so sorry, my hand flops up and down, but it's, I, I can't help myself. I can't, I can't talk and put them on the table. Um, but one of the things that we all have to know is that when you work at the state level on these issues, that is where most of the licensure for these providers does exist. And that's different than, uh, you know, being able to go after that piece. That would be the natural thought of what you would want to do at the federal level. So it does have to be a slightly different approach, and it needs to be complementary to what is being done in states. So, you know, your your bill that really takes a look at prohibiting Medicaid funding to support conversion therapy is a really, you know, wise approach in terms of, you know, there should not be government funding that goes directly to practices that are not medically approved and that are discriminatory, right? And so, so that's that's your strategic approach, which I applaud. And, and, and I actually worked on the Hill um, and got to work some with your boss back in the day um, on the House side and with the caucus. And I'm, I'm pleased that he's the one leading that piece because I know when he rolls up his sleeves and set his mind to something that he's gonna get this done. And so I do think that's one piece uh, and a critical piece of the puzzle, but then there are also you know, pieces around, is this fraud? And that's an approach that Congressman Liu has taken a look at in terms of you know, positioning that this is fraud in terms of the practice and promoting this practice. And that's what his bill would do. And then you also have a bill that really helps to track more of the data broadly uh, in terms of what happens to people in the LGBTQ community. You all have supported more data collection broadly um, and then specifically more around violence, which is a separate issue from today. But I think the support you all have had and, and I assume, Sharita, you can talk more about the data pieces uh, with all of the work CAP has done there. But, you know, that spectrum of things is great. One of the additional things that, that HRC has done is that we also have taken an approach of filing a claim with the Federal Trade Commission with the FTC. And so, you know, once again, that's, that's questioning the veracity of these treatments and that people are being duped 
to say it in, in more uh, lay terms. And it's so it's a similar approach. So these bills are complementary. And what I would say is we need the full Monty here, folks. We need all of these and then some. And that's why I'm also glad we're here with these partners today to be able to sort of lift up the hood a little more and talk further about these. But that's how I would sort of couch these is not only do we need these protections for these bad practices, we need the Equality Act, which also your boss is a champion of, to make sure we have protections broadly for the community. So we need all of the above. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jody. Absolutely. I think it's going to be an approach from so many angles and we need, you know, organizations like all of yours as well. Um, KJ, I kind of want to also touch on the state perspective, which is not something I get to look at a lot. So I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on what's going on at the state level. And, you know, we've seen so many anti-trans youth bills and it's just been a really tough year, I think, across the board. Um, so I'd love to get a sense of what's kind of going on at the state level and what you think we need to keep an eye on. Um, Cause I think people often miss those kind of local state issues, but that are actually incredibly important. Absolutely. and. Uh, I am very fortunate to live in California where we don't have as many attacks on our LGBTQ community, but there's really um, a surprising amount of work still left to do. And one of the bills that I have the fortune of working actually with Sam on, uh, Trevor Project is our sponsor. Assemblymember Rambula is championing AB 1094, which essentially creates a pilot program to start collecting um, uh, mortality data in violent deaths for LGBTQ community. So in other words, we're creating a pilot program in um, geographically and demographically diverse areas in California um, to really train coroners and medical examiners on how to collect and um, start reporting gender identity and sexual orientation so that we can start uh, collecting this data, which it sounds really dry and wonky, but the truth of the matter is until we start having those stats to figure out just how much of our LGBTQ youth are committing suicide or our uh, trans women of color are being murdered, uh, we don't have that data. And so you have to start collecting that data first to figure out where can we start directing resources on. Um, so that's one of the efforts that we're doing in California right now to really try to expand um, expand what we can be doing to support this community. I think Sam can probably talk a little bit more about what other states are going on as far as defending LGBTQ rights, but California is trying really hard right now to make sure that we're moving the needle a little bit forward and saying what we absolutely need as a bare minimum. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like California is usually ahead of us in, in most ways. So um, yeah, Sam, I'd love to hear, you know, at the state level, at the federal level, at the local level, what are the initiatives that you think are critical, especially given this new administration? I think we really have room to get something great done. So I'd love to hear your top priorities. Absolutely. I think it's, um, it's so exciting because I think we have all the different pieces of the puzzle uh, here. Thank you, Jody, for kind of mentioning, right? Like, we need it all. There's no like picking and choosing. We've really, um, it's all hands on deck kind of a moment. Um, to connect the issues that we've been talking about so far, I think it's really critical to talk about. Um, we know that conversion therapy is harmful only because suicide hotlines like, like Trevor Project and others can say like, this is causing harm. Like we can see a correlation to young people who have gone through conversion therapy are twice as likely to attempt suicide. So we can kind of make that, um, that statement. But notice that I said the word attempt because without KJ's data um, in California, we actually don't know how many of LGBTQ youth who've gone through conversion therapy will die by suicide because that's not data we collect. That's why we need the LGBTQ Essential Data Act. Um, I'll never forget like talking to members um, around the hill and you're like, I really care about death data. Like this is really important. And they're like, why? I was like, because my life mission is to end conversion therapy. I'm a survivor. I believe that we can do it, but no one will believe me that this is a real problem. No one will see it as a real problem um, until we have the data. I know I beyond certain Sharita will bring us our data data whiz uh, moment, right? But like without that data, it's really hard to get it across. So what do I see as like the breaking issues? Obviously, it's um, uh, going to be conversion therapy bills, like the prohibition of Medicaid funding for conversion therapy acts but it's also going to be local ordinances, right? Um, while we have had all these awful attacks on trans youth this year, we've also ended conversion therapy in places like Columbia, South Carolina. 
We uh, have ended it in Lexington, Kentucky, um, Anchorage, Alaska, right? Places that are hard, that there, there are not a lot of people who use they and them pronouns who can feel safe doing that. Like, but we're giving them a little bit of notice. Hey, your state hasn't gotten there yet, but your city has, right? And then when we get to the city level, I'm really, excuse me, the state level, yes, we lost. We lost quite a, too many bills this year, but I know that all of the folks on this, on this call also recognize that we won a lot. We held back a massive amount of awful legislation um, that really could have hurt us. And in federal levels, we're actually moving forward. I know uh, you are also a signatory onto the really bill that I was really proud of last year, the National Suicide Hotline Designation Act. Not necessarily what we're talking about today because we're talking about death and conversion therapy, woohoo, go pride. But uh, more importantly, it's making sure we have the resources. When someone goes through conversion therapy or is thinking about suicide, they need a resource. And that's why the National Suicide Hotline Designation Act, the very first pro-LGBTQ bill to ever be unanimously voted on by Congress, uh, is a really important thing for us to remember as we're trying to get into the next step. So all of these are connected. The biggest part to remember is that we need data and the data that we have is already proving to us that we need to end conversion therapy. So like trust the data you have and get better data to keep proving the fact. Amazing, thank you, Sam. Um, yeah, and I think it's, it's great that you mentioned the suicide hotline and the bipartisan support for that because that kind of ties into my next question, which is that we voted on the Equality Act again this Congress and we lost Republicans. Um, I think we went from eight to two maybe. Um, so I'd love, Sharita, if you could touch on just why the Equality Act is so important and also, you know, if you have any thoughts on how we can strike some coalition building with the other side. Obviously, you know, we kind of need some of them to join on for some of these so that we can actually get stuff passed. Um, how do we pull some of those moderate Republicans over and like, why do you think we've lost some, you know, this go around? I mean, as folks mentioned, um, we we definitely are very interested in sexual orientation, gender identity data. We fielded with the NORC at the University of Chicago a nationally representative study um, in 2020 on experience of discrimination and impacts. And one in three LGBTQ folks reported experiencing discrimination in the year prior. Again, I want to highlight like these are underreported numbers because most folks are just so used to discriminatory treatment in our community that they don't even recognize it or report it. Um, and within that, 62% of trans folks reported discrimination, 43% of LGBTQ folks of color, 57% of our Gen Z LGBTQ family, and 45% of disabled LGBTQ folks. So it is rampant and widespread, and the effects are really devastating. Half reported moderate or significant negative psychological impacts from discrimination. And then on top of that, LGBT folks take drastic measures to avoid situations where they might experience discrimination because the trauma and the stigma and the harm are so severe. And so for example, half of uh, LGBT folks where they experience discrimination was just in public spaces, like stores or restaurants or just living your life. And so as a result, we also have high numbers of LGBT folks saying like, I just avoid public spaces. And this is kind of, you know, pre-pandemic. Um, also, you know, we are, we just uh, celebrated the anniversary of uh, the Obergefell decision, but still over half of LGBTQ folks hide relationships to avoid discrimination, even though marriage equality is the law of the land. And for folks who experienced discrimination the year prior, uh, it's over 70%. Also, folks are avoiding uh, getting necessary health care. And so, you know, when in addition to prohibiting harmful forms of treatment that are fraudulent and not actually care, we also need to make sure that folks are getting uh, expanded access to affirming care. Um, 
And then when you're talking about, you know, communities of color and people who are living at the intersection of multiple marginalized identities, um, those numbers are so much higher. We just put out a report on uh, nationally representative data of experience of discrimination among uh, LGBTQ communities of color, which is the first kind of data set of its kind out there. Um, and as I said, like the numbers are just so much more horrific. That's why the Equality Act is such a necessary solution because it modernizes our civil rights laws and makes sure that, you know, folks like me who are religious minorities, racial minorities, and uh, sexual orientation minorities have robust protection for all of our identities in all areas of life where we need it. Um, it is common sense legislation that is very, very popular. Um, President Biden's executive order on sexual orientation and gender identity non-discrimination was more popular than giving people money. It was more popular than the stimulus checks. Like that is how popular LGBTQ rights are right now. That's huge because people love those stimulus checks. Right. <laughs> True, even among Republicans. Also, Republicans oppose discrimination against LGBTQ folks, including trans folks in healthcare. But what we're seeing is a massive disconnect between voters and where voters stand on issues and the folks that are with you on the Hill. And so what we all need to do is make sure like they are hearing from the voters that they're understanding and that they're being held accountable um, to their constituents who really don't agree with their votes here. And even on something as, um, you know, the votes for the Equality Act make no sense, but if you look at Republican support for the Equality Act, even among like in all districts across the country, majorities favor the Equality Act protections. Um, and then also, you know, even something as innocuous as just allowing CFPB to collect sexual orientation, gender identity data in business lending, um, which as we said, you know, voluntary data where even uh, Representative McHenry was talking about this being a limited common sense measure. Uh, we got 33 Republicans on it, which, you know, at least 33 Republicans, but it's also shocking that in 2021, we don't have more folks on it and why it's because the Heritage Foundation doesn't like any legislation that acknowledges our existence. And so that is kind of the extreme ideology that we're dealing with among some people that really isn't representative of our country and the values our country holds. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that ties nicely into the idea that it just isn't the values of our country anymore, but yet our Congress still has such low representation in our elected officials. I think in the entire United States Congress, there are 11 openly LGBTQ individuals, which is abysmal numbers, but the highest that there have ever been. So I would love to hear if anyone wants to pop in, you know, how can we get more of the community in office, which I think will really drive change. Can I jump in here for a quick second? Uh, I really am ready, really am ready for a congressional member to use they and them pronouns. I'm sorry, but I'm really, really ready um, to not feel like I have to educate every single member of Congress on how to respect me because they don't have a colleague who looks or, you know, has the same identities as I do. Uh, representation is a really amazing thing. And to be very clear to uh, um, uh, the representative, I really am glad that um, uh, Representative Maloney is there like making a lot of really good trouble. I, I appreciate that. I just also want him to be joined by people who understand what it's like to be non-binary, right? I want people to understand uh, the trans experience. And I think that we're getting closer, right? We'll, 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 have, we'll have chances at that. But um, yeah, if there was one dream I could have is that like when we have our next, well, maybe not the next, so let's do one before that. But like, uh, you know, a, a, a session like this in the future that we're talking about, um, we're talking about politics in a way that is more representative of the trans community than maybe just a uh, um, the current the current makeup of the. I probably sound a little bit rude to the current caucus. I'm super grateful. I just really want to have a little bit of my voice um, in Congress because it's kind of lonely. It's kind of lonely to be um, that person. I, I to to raise up and not to make, probably to make them blush, but like. KJ being the first LD um, uh, <laughs> in California, that's kind of shocking, right? Like we just said, California is kind of doing great things. 
there should have been a person that KJ could have followed, right? Like that we could have, we could have looked up to and said like, yeah, I can do this. There's a place for me at this table, but for non-binary Americans, I don't see that in the United, in the United States Congress. I just don't see a person who says like, I can understand your experience in the same way. Yeah, absolutely. It's a huge problem in not only the Congress, but, you know, across the country in almost every state house. I think it, especially again in 2021, when, you know, I think it just doesn't look, I mean, Congress doesn't look like the population at all. So I think that's a huge thing. Does anyone else have any thoughts about how we can kind of drive, um, you know, increased? Yeah, well, this is a couple of things. And Sam, what I would say is one of the things I love about working with you is you have many dreams and goals. And so I think your goal of having a non-binary member of Congress is not uh, very far out uh, and using they, them pronouns. I, I would just you know add, even in the changes of Congress, I, I think I would say I've had the good fortune of working there in multiple decades. And the change I've seen up there is extraordinary and we need more. And I would even just note too, there are more parents and grandparents today in Congress of transgender and non-binary youth. And I think that is also a change in an education that is long overdue. And many more of them are more out or more fully out. And I think that's the other, other challenge here. But in terms of this, you know, the pipeline for folks running is a big question. And there have been lots of groups, um, ours. And then of course, I think we all know our, one of our partners, the um, uh, Victory Fund. Um, supporting candidates up and down the ticket all across the country. Um, and we have seen the increase in transgender and hopefully in this election cycle, non-binary folks, more folks elected um, at the local and, and regional levels or county levels, if you will. And so, so pipeline is an important piece of this. And the other thing that I would say that day in, day out gives me hope and also makes this current conversation around conversion therapy acute, in my opinion, is depending upon which poll you look at, either one in five or one in six youth are identifying and young adults are identifying as openly LGBTQ. And I think that's spectacular. And I think it's going to um, offer us opportunities and challenges in our society and in our electoral spaces and in like everywhere we can think of. And when we think about issues like conversion therapy, you know, the, the thing that um, I always think about about our community, we aren't, people might perceive that, oh, we're in New York and we're in San Francisco. Oh no, we are all over the country. And I know, you know, Sam, you have Iowa roots. I have Iowa roots. I'm not sure where other folks are from, but you know, I didn't grow up in Washington, DC. I grew up in a tiny town in Iowa. And I think our community and those folks who are coming up and out, um, at younger ages are all over the country. And that is one of the key reasons we're gonna see change. And it's also one of the key reasons there will be a future pipeline of elected officials. And we are going to start growing that pipeline hand over fist in the next decade. That's my prediction. And I, I don't, it, with all the data, since we're all kind of being data nerds today about some of this, is like, I don't see how it could be any different just seeing the, the level of populations. When I was young, people would say one in 10, but I guarantee you that a good chunk of those folks were well in the closet. That is not what we're seeing today. And I think it's one of the brightest, brightest lights for our movement in our community. Yeah, I, I think this this younger generation is gonna knock our socks off, absolutely. I think that they're so inspired, so excited to get out there and they will not take no for an answer. So I'm excited to see the pipeline start with them. And it's gonna be really great. Um, does anyone else wanna jump in or we can jump to the next question? Those were such great answers. I, I just piggybacking off of that. I think it's not just getting the elected officials but also getting staffers. And the best way we can do that is providing the mentorship by seeing people that want to have a way to get involved and making sure that we're actively including them and making them feel that their voice is just as important as everybody else. Because I know growing up, I'm from Ohio, so Midwest love for sure. Um, you know, I didn't have that. I didn't have that mentor who was like me. I had no idea what non-binary was. Maybe that's just because I'm a little older and it's, there just hasn't been it. And so the best thing that we can do both as, you know, having elected officials who are, 
as either allies or non-binary or trans themselves is to make sure they're hiring staff and doing outreach in their communities to make sure that the next generation of both staff and electeds are there. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I think that even the Democratic Party has a problem with this. We, you know, say that we want a diverse workforce and diverse staff and we want to be inclusive and we need to do that in a practice. Absolutely. Um, great. Well, thank you so much, guys. I think those are really, really robust answers. And I guess just to wrap it up, um, I'd love to kind of go around and hear um, what does pride mean for you personally? And, you know, how do you celebrate pride as we round out June? Anyone can start. Sam usually starts. <laughs> I, I usually start, which is why I was trying to not do it. I was like counting to 10 being like, I'm not doing it. Okay, so well, I'll do it, fine. Um, okay, so here's the thing about pride. I connect pride um, uh, to this like ancestral celebration. Like just like um, any other big holiday where we're remembering something. Um, some holidays are somewhat religious. Some holidays are historical, right? There, there's something about it that we're trying to pass down from generation to generation as like, this is something to be honored, right? So pride for me is the, the ancestral transfer that I don't ever get from my family, right? Like I don't have a family that because of, as a survivor of conversion therapy, I will probably never have a family who, who shares with me the stories of Marsha P. Johnson, who, who um, honors me with Bayard Rustin tales, right? Like who gives me um, moments of Harvey Milk, right? Like that's not my family, but my community, my, my community does that. In Pride there, month, there's this, I'm sorry, I get so excited. I need to calm down. I get so happy, but like Pride Month is this awesome time where where people who aren't from the same generation as me will tell me what it was like to be that one in 10, right? Where I get to talk to, to um, young people in the middle of nowhere and say, you know what? There's a place for you in this world. Like I get to walk the halls of Congress in my stilettos and not a single person bats an eye. You get to do that too whenever you come and visit, right? Like that's, that's what pride is. Pride is that transfer that we may never have from a family, but we will always have as a community. It's so beautiful. Oh, sorry. Gosh, okay, well, who's gonna top this? Sharita? This is why I wasn't gonna go first, exactly. <laughs> Shoot, I should have gone first so I didn't have to follow that. Um, I mean, I'm just so obnoxious during Pride, I feel like, because it is that time to celebrate. And I think this year in particular, the last year has been so hard for so many of our communities. And then with all of the violence being inflicted on folks, it's just been a release this year and like a, a taking of space that we deserve to take. And I'm so very aware of the privilege I have to be in DC and be able to be open and myself. But unfortunately, like even in DC, I've heard of um, friends in my community and folks that I know who have been under assault even this month um and so it, you know it's i kind of hold these two things where i you know, we are so privileged to be here and so fortunate and i want every single person in my family in the country to feel this way and to be this free um but then also it's a reminder that you know we're not there yet and we've got a ways to go and i think that's also to talk to sam about like this um heritage that we have is one of struggle and one of fighting for our liber for our collective liberation and so i think that's like the other aspect of this it's a celebration and a reminder of the um struggle and fight that we continue uh, to be a part of wow well, yeah no definitely um kj i honestly don't know how i could top either of those <laughs> answers it really is about passing along the the fact you know um Stonewall was a riot and we're not done with our work. Pride to me is a celebration of our community, passing along the stories, but also making sure that we're continuing the advocacy we have for what we still need to do. Um, there's still so much work to be done. There's still so much that intersectionality that needs to work that needs to be done that to me, Pride is a chance to really shine a light on the work that we are doing, celebrate where we've come from and just be proud to be who we are. 
Thank you, Jody. Round us out. Tough to follow this crew. So I'm going to echo, um, you know, feeling so many different things across uh, Pride Month and truthfully doing this work year round. Um, I feel so fortunate to be able to work and support and vision a future for the LGBTQ community and to honor the past. And then, of course, for Pride Month, it always feels a little personal. And, you know, for me, I have two teenagers and I have had the good fortune to be able to take them to political events that the community has and to, um, you know, have them go to the Supreme Court when the Obergefell decision was being argued and then go back when we won during Pride Month. And so for me, it brings up those shorter uh, memories in terms of my family and making sure that my kids understand our family's heritage and, and how important that is um, to us and also the work that we still have to do. And so I'm reminded of all of the above. And just because Sam shared more exuberance, I do wanna share, and Sam and I have been at many events together. I just want you to know, Sam, I ratcheted up the wardrobe this pride and I got platform rainbow shoes and so that that was stepping out for me and I, I wore them a couple of times to different events this month and I've had the biggest time so I feel I feel inspired on that front too but not to make light of this just to have a little fun with this group um, but you know the work we do is really important and that we can come together and celebrate our history and the possibilities that we see in the future. And that combination of things for me is, is so valuable. And I look forward to continuing this fight for liberation, for full legal equality in this country and for a vision and future for our youth where they can feel celebrated from the, the moment that they even think about coming out um, in this country or that they're not ready to be out. They know there's a whole crew waiting for them and we will embrace them fully. And so I would do that. And you know what, Beverly, I don't think you should get off the hook. I think you should share what pride means to you. How about that? Gosh, uh, well, now I follow all of you. I should have started. I should have been, I should have thought about this. I mean, I think that like, one, this has been so inspiring to work for Congressman Maloney, who is the highest ranking LGBTQ member in the United States Congress is an inspiration. Um, and to get to work with all of, all of you, you know, every day to fight the good fight has been really, you know, the honor of my life. And I think pride reminds me of the fun parts of it um, and why we fight and why we do what we do. So I feel really honored to have this job and to have a voice and to give you guys an even bigger platform and a bigger voice. So I think that's kind of my PC work answer, um, but we can do a fun answer offline. Um, Jody, are you wearing the heels right now? <laughs> no, and I realized, man, if I had them in there in my car because of the last event I went to. And so if I had them in here, I would be showing them to you, but I am not wearing them at this moment, but they do exist. And I've had so much fun. Well, next time. Can't wait to see them. Yeah. Can't wait to see them. Next time we're all together and we can have, um, you know, in-person stuff. I'd love, we can all wear our, our rainbow stilettos. Um, well, thank you so much, guys. I know you are incredibly busy this month. Um, this has been really, really informative. Lots of really great data, which I think adds context for people, especially again, you know, I keep bringing up the other side, um, but I think that they like data too. So, you know, I hope that this new Congress, this new administration, we can really get some great things done. And I know that you guys will be by our side the entire time. So yeah, thank you so much. We'll definitely try and send around a recording and some follow-ups, but thank you again. Pops all around. <laughs> all right. Bye everyone. Thank you. Take care.